Welcome to the Invest with Clarity podcast, where you will learn how success in investing, as in life, is the result of absolute clarity. Mark Pearson of Nepsis in Minneapolis, Minnesota, shares his passion for portfolio management and commitment to transparency and communication to allow investors to fully understand what they own and why, bringing them to clarity in their investments. And now, here are your co-hosts, Matt Halloran and Mark Pearson. Hello and welcome to another Invest with Clarity podcast. I've got Chuck and Mark with us today. This is part three of the four part mini series talking about the four keys to successful investing. Now, the first one was about philosophy. The second was about strategy. Today, we're going to talk about flexibility. Mark, I'm just going to turn this over to you, my friend. You are a good man. Always good to be with you. Always good to have search with us as well. So let me begin by stating that as it's the third of the four part piece, we actually years ago trademarked philosophy, strategy, flexibility, and transparency. It is a, call it a, a phrase of the four cornerstones of our investment process. And we have discussed all of these in the past in various examples. But I think what's kind of cool today is, as you know, I was contacted yesterday to uh, be interviewed for a feature article in a major financial pub. And the interview is around active versus passive money management, which of course, you couldn't set that ball on the tee any, any better for me as it pertains to that, because as you've often heard me say, and Chuck's heard me say, if you're a business owner, right? Let's just say, let's break this down common sense. If you're a business owner, wouldn't it stand to reason with common sense, of course, that you want every advantage you can get against your competitors? Yeah, absolutely. Right. So when you are an investor in companies that you buy through a market, the stock market, as you've heard me say many times before, fellas, you don't invest in the stock market, you invest in businesses. Wouldn't stand the reason that if I invest in businesses, wouldn't I want the greatest advantage I could possibly get in being successful and investing in the businesses I own? You guys, you realize that this is a podcast, so they can't hear your head shaking. <laughs> They don't hear the marbles knocking around, Mark? What's going on? Dude? I mean, you guys are over there like, oh, yeah, keep preaching it. And no one's hearing anything. We, we, yes. We, all right, guys. Yes. We firmly right. agree with you, Mr. Pierce. You guys right, take man. a nap, and I'll just ramble for the next hour. So, okay. So this article that they're going to interview me for is about active versus passive management. And I have argued, of course, I want to invest like a business owner. We invest like business owners, which means that business owners are what? Active in managing the business they own. So to me, passive management is a cookie cutter, you know, yes. allocate it and leave it alone. That's not investing, folks. That's asset allocating. You got there it. are two very different things. And most financial advisors, as much as they'll want to tell you that they are quote unquote money managers, they're not. They're asset allocators. They allocate your portfolio in mutual funds and ETFs. You have no idea what you own. You have no idea where your risks are. And it's, it's the old modern portfolio theory scenario that you know Matt and I just went over in a podcast a few ago about the flaws regarding it. So let's break this down simpler. If I'm a business owner, which if you buy companies in a stock market, you are a business owner. Absolutely. The difference between you and let's say a guy like Matt Halloran or a guy like myself who own our businesses, we can control a lot of the aspects of our businesses. As an investor of a publicly traded company, you don't necessarily have the ability to control what management and others are going to do. However, you have other phenomenal advantages that if you are a passive investor, you do not either A, get the ability 
to have these advantages. Or if you have an advantage, it's very minimal. Let me give you a great example. Roth conversions. If you're not doing a Roth conversion in companies you own on an annual basis, you're hurting yourself. What's a Roth conversion? Roth conversion is you take a company you own in your IRA, a stock you own in your IRA, and you convert it to a Roth IRA. You pay tax on the value of the stock the day you do the Roth conversion. As the stock continues to grow over time, it grows tax-free. In most portfolios, there are always great businesses that go through bad periods. And those are the kind of companies you can literally say, hey, I'm going to Roth convert this and put this in my Roth IRA. Now, can you do that in a passive environment where you have mutual funds and ETFs? Yes, you can convert a mutual fund or an ETF to a Roth. But the potential for tax-free growth, in my opinion, gets diminished because it's a bucket of stocks. So there is a great example of passive versus active or active versus passive. At the end of the day, you want to be in the biggest competitive position you can be to grow your portfolio. Exactly. Now I'm going to, I'm going to pause you there because I think yep. something that we've done on these other episodes, Mark, is you gave an operational definition of the term. And so now that you've laid a really good foundation, let's actually take a step back and say, okay, here's what Nepsis means when they say flexibility. Yeah. If you own individual businesses versus mutual funds or exchange traded funds, flexibility creates the opportunity for you to pick and choose the most advantageous company to do a Roth conversion in. When you're in a mutual fund, you don't have that. The flexibility is key. Now, remember the four keys, philosophy, strategy, flexibility, and transparency. Remember that philosophy and strategy are your empirical components of investing and flexibility and transparency are the behavioral psychological aspects of it. Let's punt that now to Chuck, because Chuck has done a bunch of podcasts with you about the behavioral components yes. of why you would want flexibility. Chuck, do you mind if we kind of turn this over to you? No, I do, Matt. And, and I love the way, Mark, you teed this up because anytime an industry defines a term, we tend to not even question it. So you mentioned active versus passive. What happens if the question was this? is do you as an investor desire a flexible process or one that's constrained? Constrained, I should say, right? If the discussion was put in that capacity and you ask someone whether you want to have your investments constrained to an index, would somebody want that or they would want the manager to have the flexibility to drive a process? And, yes. and I think that if we put it in that vain that and I'm, I'm passing this to you now what would that say to a process if somebody said it's constrained that would not be appealing right well right well here's the other thing let's talk about tax loss harvesting the ability to sell a stock for a tax loss by another company in the same sector at the same time because you want to be in the sector that's why when you invest you invest top down and bottoms up you the Originally, the whole, the whole premise of flexibility had multiple pieces to it. But when I first came up with this phrase, the ultimate reason why I chose flexibility was not because of the flexibility in tax loss harvesting, not because of the flexibility of where I could literally do Roth conversions to potentially enhance that client's long-term success in their portfolio. I did it because of volatility. And exactly. volatility is the number one thing. In let's look, guys, bluntly, do you think that most investors think about tax loss harvesting or no. think about Roth conversions? No. No, particularly on the institutional side, right? So, when you work with a firm that does a separately managed account strategy like we do, meaning your money is not commingled with anybody else's, 
you have complete flexibility on where you want to do a Roth conversion. You have complete flexibility on tax loss harvesting. And, oh, by the way, you have complete flexibility of where you take money from if you need cash. You may not, let's say you come out and you say, hey, I need $10,000, $20,000. A lot of times your, your advisor is going to take all of your funds or take a portion from one or two funds to get you your money. But what if you have a stock that's run through the roof, is overweighted in your portfolio, and it's a perfect time to lay in some capital gains and reduce risk in one position? What if you have two positions to do that? Again, these are common sense, literally competitive advantages in enhancing your ability to be successful. Like I said, if you're a business owner and if you own stocks, you are a business owner. Would it stand to reason you want every possible advantage you can get? That coincides also, guys, with the whole idea of when the flexibility piece came up originally is this idea of volatility. The, the greatest example, I, I mean, I can give multiple examples, but let's just talk for a minute about the COVID crash. This is the greatest example of how a market and company values crashed quickly. And most advisors probably would have said, or most investors probably would have said, hey, this is short term. You got to ride it out. Our response to our clients was, screw that. We're not doing that. We're going to sell weaker companies to buy stronger companies on sale. We're going to tax loss harvest companies in one sector and buy another one in the same sector at a lower price. And we're going to take every advantage we can of the COVID situation. Flexibility, volatility. Now, the response to that, man, and Chuck would be, of course, well, that hasn't happened. I mean, that was a one-time event. Couldn't no. agree more. Well, well, no, but, hold on, well, hold on. Yeah, yeah, okay. That quickly. But crashes, the, the financial crisis in mm -hmm. 2007, 8, and 9. Uh, Asian contagion. You can go, the stock, look what's going on in the NASDAQ right now, a la 2000 tech stocks, the bubble burst, and they were crashing, right? That kind of volatility creates the opportunity for an investor who has information at that point to make a decision to enhance their portfolio. Because the reality is many things cannot have a decision made until other things happen at that time. And flexibility is the only thing that creates you the opportunity to take advantage of that. Okay. I don't know if I've ever said this to you on the show, which is weird. Cause I mean, gosh, we've covered much. the, yeah, yeah. Well, no, we, we just, we've covered the gambit. But what I'm hearing from you sounds like a lot of work, Mark, right? So the tracking of all of this and picking this one and getting rid of this one to invest in this one and what companies are on sale and all of that stuff, is it just that other advisors don't want to do the work? Is that really what's behind? Because the philosophy, the foundation that you're building just makes so much sense. I'm just sitting here thinking to myself, why wouldn't other people want to take advantage of that? What? Why aren't other advisors doing that? Well most financial advisors are not money managers. That's number one, right? They're asset allocators. They look at the investment objectives and they pluck in the growth and income, balanced income and growth or income. <clears throat> we have those same five models. The difference is in all five of our models, many of the clients own the same companies. It's just the percentage and the tweaking of the allocation to reduce the volatility based on the investment needs of that client. Okay. I will tell you that the majority of, by the way, in 2020, when the COVID, 2020? Yeah, 2020. Yes. I'll tell you what, I got COVID brain. In 2020, we had the best year in history. Our average client portfolio in our growth models was up about 55%. Past performance is not indicative of future performance. But I will tell you, at the risk of someone saying I'm a complete idiot and that I got lucky, that's fine. They can do that. But I literally sat in the chair of my basement because everyone was locked out from their office. And I literally did all the trading and my team did the trading from the computers because we have everything automated. We have everything set up technologically that when we do a trade for a client, we do it for everyone, not just one client. We do what's called block trading. If I have Chuck in a growth portfolio and I have Matt in a balance portfolio and I want to buy Verizon, 
you both own Verizon, I buy a block of it, but it goes into the allocation of the model that you are in. So the work behind block trading or managing the allocation of portfolios is not a lot of work. What is frankly more work is going in when they want distributions, when they want money taken out. You have to go in and look at the account directly individually and say, okay, we're going to sell this. We're going to sell that. We've got this is out of whack on the allocation. This is going on in the market. That's going on in the market yada, yada, and you make the decisions and you tell the trading team, this is what we're going to sell. And so that's the power of the flexibility on picking and choosing where you sell. Again, this is stuff that people don't think about, Matt. But the reality at the end of the day is if you are a business owner, forget investing in the stock market. If you're a business owner, you want every advantage you can get to be competitive against your competition. And your competition isn't other investors. So don't get yourself into the ideology of you got to compare your portfolio and do all this and that. We've talked about with Chuck many times how bad that is to compare. You know, it's the thief of all joy, right? Um, what you want to comp what you want to compete against is your inability to not accomplish your financial goals. That's your competition. And in order to beat that competition which is the inability to accomplish your financial goals. You need as much flexibility as you possibly can to accomplish that goal. So as with physical flexibility, right, there is some preparation that needs to be done in order to make it so that if you're trying to touch your toes, you don't blow out your hammies, right? right. And that's part of what Chuck brings to the table when it comes to flexibility is a lot of the research and the preparedness to make sure that when you guys do want to execute, you don't proverbially pull a muscle. So yeah. Chuck, what are some of the steps that you do to help all of the team at Nepsis and all of the clients have this level of flexibility? Yeah, thanks for asking the question, Matt. I think it's it's spot on here in our discussion. And you do think about the, what the definition of flexibility, like if you look it up in, on, in the web, and I think you, you hit the nail on the head, it's, it's this ability to be easily modified. Like another one is the willingness to change. So Mark has developed a process which is open to that. So there is discussion daily throughout the day on various components that we're looking at that would meet our criteria. So this flexibility piece is we understand that this volatility, as Mark says, provides these opportunities. So, you know, it gets back to this drilling down as Mark started out by saying, what is actually the definition of passive investing? It's a massive constraint that, that's put on an advisor because they can't modify the index. They can't change the index is what it is, right? Now there is reconstitution, but that advisor investor is not in control. Mark and team are in control. Our decisions and our process are driven that structure by the flexibility. And I think that's the, the greatest thing. We realize we need to modify as the world is changing and yes. we love that. We love the volatility. We love what Mark just said. When we get a gift, it's a 15 to 20% sell-off. When others are looking at it, oh my goodness, my account's down. Yeah, and that gets back to the whole idea of the top-down versus bottom-up part, part of the strategy that we've talked about on the strategy podcast. You want to look at the macro environment. You know, every the big talk right now is about active versus passive. The big talk right now is the massive shift with what's going on in the NASDAQ from the high value growth stocks to value stocks. We made that shift over a year ago. I mean, we, we have been preparing for this for over a year. Now, uh, you know, when you look at some of the companies that we have bought in the last year and how they have performed as great businesses, they were on sale because there's, there are macro aspects of the decisions behind the companies you want to invest in and there are the bottom up, the financial aspect, how a company is run, their brand, right? We buy brands. We buy businesses that have great brands. That's why, you know, Matt, I spent years ago talking to Chuck when we first started out and changing the name to Nepsis and the power behind the brand of investing with clarity. 
And this is an advantage I really believe as a firm we have that no one else has in the market. We own the trade for clarity in investing. And as time goes on, particularly millennials, who they're all talking about how millennials are buying more and more individual stocks. They're going to this uh, Robin Hood and all these other places, and they're buying individual stocks on their own. There's no commissions now to buy stocks on their own from Schwab or T or whoever. And they're getting more engaged and getting attached to the companies that they want to invest in. That's investing with clarity. And, you know, it's a process to invest, right? Process before progress. But active has always been, to me, a significant advantage to passive investing. Because it only takes one emotional decision for an investor to make that could dramatically impact their financial future. And clarity is designed to minimize or eliminate that as much as possible. I love that you just brought up uh, the fact that in, in Robin hood and in those sorts of uh, application based trading things that, that, because I'm involved in all of those and you're right. Not only do I buy individual stocks because that's what you do, but I've also made huge mistakes doing stupid <laughs> emotional stuff, right? Uh, when I should have right. just held on to it because I realized it was a good company and I do believe in the brand. And I love the fact that at the beginning and throughout this, you've been talking about as a business owner, right? I, as a right. business owner, I want as much flexibility, but I believe in my brand. And so now in learning from you, the stocks and stuff that I own are brands that I believe in yes. long term are going to, and I don't touch the stuff. Here's the other right. thing. You know, one of the great things about flexibility, you know, uh, all of the things that we've talked about, philosophy, strategy, and tra- flexibility up to this point, is I'm not as worried. Yeah. Right. I'm not looking at my stuff incessantly, like in Mark, you know this, and Chuck, you know this yeah. too. There are a lot of investors, they're checking their stuff five, six times a day, right? Because they're so concerned about it because they don't have a strong philosophy. They don't have the right strategy. They're not understanding what flexibility means. And of course, our last one is transparency. So talk about that a little bit. Well, you just laid it up on the T again for me in terms of the flexibility. One of the things that I often like to say, and you said, hey, I invest in businesses I know. One of the biggest mistakes people will make is they will not only make an emotional decision to buy a sell stock, they'll make it an emotional decision to buy a stock because they have an emotional attachment to that company. And that can be equally dangerous. And flexibility provides the ability that if you've made this emotional decision to a brand, you have the flexibility to change it if you want to down the road. I often say to clients and you know my advisors that just because it's a great company doesn't mean it's a great investment. Yeah, got it. And it's extremely important to understand that. And that's why you have to have a philosophy and a strategy that intertwines with the flexibility and transparency. And I've given it away for free, you know, on these podcasts. If you want to be your own investor, I, of course, I've been doing this a long time. There are very, very few individual investors that I would feel okay that they're managing their own money because it is more difficult than you think. And the reason for that is very simple. Investing is not linear. In other words, it's not constant. It's not black and white. There are variables and many times unseen variables, unanticipated variables that can shake the entire tree. And that's why we always talk about the idea that not only do you invest like a business owner, but you have to have the flexibility to take advantage of not only volatility, but other factors, whether it's a Roth conversion, whether it's tax loss harvesting, whether a piece of news comes out in a company that alters the game plan for that company or the asset allocation of your portfolio. There's so many variables, it's impossible to manage all of those and it's impossible to predict all of them. And that's why you've got to have the right asset allocation, but you also have to stick to the process before progress and flexibility is one of the cornerstones of that process. 
All right, Chuck, do you want to give us a little bit of a preview on the transparency component of the four keys? I do, because I think it's a great lead in and transparency is kind of the crescendo of the four keys, right? We just pivot from philosophy, strategy, flexibility, now transparency. And, and, and I ask this question here because this is the lead in it. Anybody who's listening to this investor, advisor, I'm going to challenge them. I want the challenge is, do you know how your ETF index constituents are determined? We did a test on this. Now, what do I mean by that? Go to the prospectus. Look at the algorithmic model in how the actual components of that index are chosen. <laughs> you, you, you would actually, unless it. you got your master's in mathematics, you're going to lose right. it. Exactly. <laughs> are, you, are you talking about clarity, Chuck? <laughs> yes, I am. And the transparency, if you were to ask Mark and I, we got 34 companies. We know most, if not everything, about those companies, but more importantly, why they're in the portfolio and how they interact with each other. That's transparency. And every one of our investors has the ability to know that. Take the challenge. Look at that ETF index and how it owns and why it owns those stocks. No one has any idea. It made my head spin, guys. Yeah, I love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. and you yeah. put all your money into that. I don't know. <laughs> It's exactly. like being a business owner of a car wash or a restaurant or something. You throw the money in there with no strategy. Exactly. No, you have a philosophy about how you want to run your restaurant. Do you have a strategy? Do you have the flexibility and transparency to do the things to run your restaurant? Or Matt, in your own individual business, right? Those four key components are, they go across all industries, all businesses. Every business Absolutely. should have a philosophy and strategy. Every business should have a level of flexibility and transparency to enhance your ability to be successful longer term. Oh, I get so excited. Okay. About stuff. All right, everybody. Well, we're going to go ahead and wrap up the show today. We will finish this four part mini series with what we just talked about there, which is the idea of transparency. If you have not subscribed to the show, make sure that you do. If you know somebody who is, I don't know, looking at the prospectus like Chuck was just talking about and their eyes start bleeding because they can't figure out the mathematics behind it, please share this podcast with them. Let's give them the uh, the gift of actually investing with clarity. We would all appreciate it. And I know your friends and family will too. So for Chuck, Mark, everybody at Nepsis, I'm Matt Halloran and we'll see you on the other side of the mic very soon. The content discussed is for informational purposes only. It is not a solicitation or recommendation for any securities that may be mentioned herein. Advisory services offered through Nepsis Inc., an SEC registered investment advisor.